All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, to introduce our speakers and give us a bit more information on this webinar series, we have Shailene Shaveria, who works for the Office of Tribal uh, Relations on with us today. I wanna welcome Shailene to go ahead and turn your camera on and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I wanna start by saying good afternoon um, and thank you to all who have joined in on today's webinar and in past presentations in this series. Um, I hope that you all have been able to uh, take away something from this series. Um, I'm Shailene Chavaria. I'm a member of Santa Clara Pueblo, and I'm also a scientist working in the USGS Office of Tribal Relations. Today, we'll hear about um, a couple of examples of successful indigenous knowledge engagement. Um, and now I'll provide a brief introduction of today's speakers starting with uh, Sarah Rinkovich. Uh, Sarah received her PhD in wildlife conservation from the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment in 2012. Her research focused on a, reintrodu on a reintroduced population of Mexican gray wolves on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation, homeland to the White, Mount, uh, White, Mountain, uh, White Mountain Apache tribe. Dr. Rankovich received her master's degree in 1991 from Humboldt State University, where she studied habitat preferences of Mexican spotted owls in Zion, Zion National Park, Utah. She's worked for the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, in endangered species conservation since 1993 and currently works in the branch of recovery and restoration. Dr. Rankovich works extensively with tribes on management and conservation of threatened and endangered species on tribal lands within the Southwest. Um, after that, we'll hear from uh, Kathy Kat Techman, um, who is a University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension Environmental Outreach State Specialist. Uh, she's passionate about weaving together indigenous and academic science to build environmental leadership in youth to adult learners. CAT partners with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission and tribal specialists to create initiatives that integrate Ojibwe ecological and leadership knowledge, including Gikono Wiziwe Ojini Woban, also known as GWAW, Changing Climate Change, Changing Culture, Minisan, Connecting Ojibwe Ecological Knowledge and Climate Change, and Indigenizing Leadership Development Programs. Kathy coordinates the University of Wisconsin Division of Extension Climate Leadership Team and is a member of the University of Wisconsin Extension Native American Task Force. She lives and works in the homeland of the Lake Superior Ojibwe people with an office at the Iron County University of Wisconsin Extension office in Hurley, Wisconsin. Uh, after that, we will hear from um, Koyulalani Morishke. Um, she's a Native Hawaiian program specialist and NOAA affiliate for Papahanaumoku Akihe Marine National Monument, supporting Native Hawaiian advocacy and engagement across research policy and management to, to guide the co-management of the National Monument. For the, for the past 15 years through her work in Native Hawaiian nonprofit organization, Namakunona, she has been working alongside local communities, weaving Native Hawaiian knowledge systems and academic science, science tools, scientific tools to support communities of um, Hilo or conscious observers working towards Aina Momona, Aina Momona, healthy and productive lands, oceans, and communities. And lastly, we'll hear from uh, Nicole Herman Mercer. Uh, Nicole began at the USGS in 2008 as a student intern in support of Native American Relations, also known as CISNAR. Um, which is a program funded by the USGS Office of Tribal Relations. As a CISNAR, she completed a case study of indigenous observations of climate change in a rural Alaska village in the Yukon River Basin while completing her master's degree in social science at the University of Colorado, Denver. Her work explores the interactions between different knowledge systems regarding human dimensions of landscape change and water resources in rural Alaska native villages. She focuses on the co-production of knowledge, utilizing community-based 
precipitate participatory methods in the Arctic and subarctic to form a better understanding of environmental change and impacts on the population of this region. Um, and before we move on, we just want to share uh, the artwork that was created for uh, this webinar series. Uh, and this is uh, a depiction created by Coral Avery with the support of the webinar series planning team. Um, and Coral is with the BIA Tribal Climate Resilience Program and the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. And um, I'll just read what is on this, uh, on this slide. Although one image cannot fully encapsulate the expanse of indigenous knowledge, this visual is intended to show the connection of native, native species and indigenous cultures stretching from the Pacific Islands to the east coast of the US. It includes the medicine wheel to symbolize the health and prosperity of people and the environment, um, Turtle Island, which symbolizes either North America or both North and South America, depending on the storyteller, and water surrounds the image as it sustains life. Inspiration was taken from the native storytelling um, and the personal connections that members of the webinar series planning team and the artists have with the species and symbols. Um, and that's all I have. Uh, take it away, Sarah. Thank you. Hear me? Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. So my presentation to you today, thank you again for having me and I'm looking forward to um, hearing the other, uh, other speakers today. But I wanna talk about some examples of indigenous knowledge in Endangered Species Act listing decisions and what are called SSAs, Species Status Assessments. So I've been working for the Fish and Wildlife Service for uh, about 30 years, all in endangered species and with tribes. So I, my examples are both um, things that involve endangered species listing decisions and SSAs. And a couple of my examples I have not been directly involved with, but several of them I have. The first one is the polar bear listing, the final rule to list the polar bear. In May 2008, the Fish and Wildlife Service published a final rule to list the polar bear as a threatened species. And this referenced um, several uh, Alaska Native uh, tribes and um, people that had information about population numbers. So our region in Alaska did an extensive ethnographic study on the local knowledge of polar bears and included this within the proposed and final rule of 2008. And what they did was a series of interviews with Alaska Natives, and they've been doing this from the early 1990s. What they would do is interview uh, hunters, people who knew about polar bears, and put maps down and put plastic down on top of the maps and basically put mylar down and ask questions about polar bear feeding areas, denning, seasonal movements, et cetera. So these people had a wealth of knowledge that went into our decision-making regarding the polar bear um, declining in certain areas. Data that was, that was information that was definitely not previously known by Western science or in the literature. That was my, that's my first example. I ran across this when I was doing my uh, dissertation at the University of Arizona. And I just thought this was a fabulous example, of the Fish and Wildlife Service in our Alaskan region using indigenous knowledge. Another example was the bald eagle in the uh, Sonoran Desert in Arizona. This one I was directly involved with. So the service, we delisted the, the bald eagle, a great success story. So it was removed off the endangered species list in 2007 because it was recovered. There was a population within Arizona that was called the Sonoran Desert population. And we were petitioned to keep this one population in Arizona as a listed species under uh, our DPS policy, which is distinct population segment. So the Game and Fish and Fish and Wildlife Service had 30 years of data monitoring the nests within the unique habitat, as you can see from these pictures of bald eagles in the desert, 
that showed an increasing population. You can see the one to the to the left was um, has a saguaro in it, and then the the one on the right is a bald eagle on cliffs. So they're they're in unique uh, in um, nesting areas, a little bit more unique than you would see other bald eagles throughout the country and in Alaska. Several of the tribes in Arizona came in with a lot of information. Uh, the White Mountain Apache tribe and the San Carlos Apache tribe in the Gila River Indian community wanted the species to be kept protected because they wanted to make sure that their nest, um, their nest was protected, the species was, was protected for obvious reasons, for cultural reasons and for collecting feathers. The tribes came in with over 150 years of knowledge. I say over because it was more like a thousand years of information regarding where they had been collecting nests, where they had been collecting feathers from nest sites. What they documented was a range contraction where the eagles were in the reservoirs, the man-made reservoirs within Arizona and several of the areas around in the out, outside of central Arizona, they were not finding nests. So they were documenting a decline or a range contract, contraction. The service did not list the species as a distinct population segment, but we did put this information into our federal register document for um, documenting that the tribes did come in with this information. The decision was not to list. Another example, this is one that I was not involved with, but very good. Um, so this is an example of the service using indigenous knowledge and species status assessment. So the Alexander Archipelago wolf is a subspecies of gray wolf that is in Southeast Alaska and British Columbia. Uh, we were petitioned several times to list this species and we do need to have a finding uh, later this year. What the service did was contract out uh, a ethnography study to put into this uh, species status assessment. And this um, contractor interviewed several uh, several um, people within villages within the area of where this uh, wolf occurs. And this is an appendix within the SSA, the Species Status Assessment, on in, entitled Indigenous Engagement with Alexander Archipelago Wolf and Applied Study of Traditional Ecological Knowledge. And this person, uh, Dr. Brooks and Dr. Lingham, they were uh, pretty well recept, um, accepted into some of these villages. So they knew, they knew a lot of the elders that they were talking to. And they got incredibly great information that filled information gaps from what the Fish and Wildlife Service had in their species status assessment. A lot of cultural significance, of course, but also about population health of the individual animals, wolf's movements, and then impacts to wolves and prey. Their primary prey is uh, uh, mule deer. And so they got quite a bit of information about where the wolves occur and where their prey does, and especially with regards to changes with past timber harvest, which was detrimental to the prey and also to the wolf and uh, information on climate change. The example that also staying with gray wolves was one that I was directly involved with was um, a, uh, um, a study that I did with our region six, our mountain prairie region to incorporate uh, traditional ecological knowledge into their species of status, status assessment for the gray wolf. This does not include the Mexican gray, gray wolf, which is here in Arizona. The objective was to hear from indigenous knowledge holders about the gray wolf. And I also met with natural resource wildlife directors and uh, tribal historic preservation officers. We are on a tight time frame, So when I flew up north, to meet with these folks, I went directly to the cultural preservation officers. So this is just a map of the gray wolf, uh, where the gray wolf um, analysis area was, and the yellow is where the current distribution is uh, of, the, of the gray wolf. So I met with the Nez Perce tribe, Blackfeet Nation, Eastern Shoshone, Crow Nation, the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes, which is actually three tribes in Northern Arapaho, and I asked pretty, pretty basic questions. Um, I did these unstructured interviews um, and, and asked, and I'll get to that in a minute, and asked um, some very simple questions. So I met with the Nez Perce tribe in person, and I met with the Shoshone and Crow after making some contacts virtually. 
And so, like I said, we only had a couple of months to do this. Um, my open-ended questions were, were very simple. What is the name of the wolf? What do you call him in your native language? What does it translate to? And can you tell me a story about the wolf? And I heard extremely important cultural stories that I was very fortunate to hear, not as, with as much detail as they would tell tribal members, but I did hear stories and anything else. Yes, I was very, very um, fortunate to be told, uh, felt very privileged to be told these stories. So in my report, that is also an appendix to the uh, species status assessment that our uh, Denver um, office did is the wolf is central figure in stories, it's significantly important to the cultures, the, the tribes that I interviewed, those that list that I showed you. Very important to the land, it's part of the ecosystem. They are healers and cleansers. They take this, sometimes they take the sick and the diseased animals. And the wolves were teachers. They taught people how to hunt through observations. So again, indigenous understandings and scientific understandings of wolves um, can help benefit both. And they were, they were the tribes that I met with, the, the knowledge holders were extremely um, thrilled to tell me their stories and the fact that just showing up <laughs> in person. And I think that was my last slide. Yes. Yes, that was my last slide. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you very much. Indigenous Cat or Kathy Techman. Um, hello, all my relatives. My name is Kathy or Cat Techman. I'm an environmental outreach state specialist with the University of Wisconsin Division of Extension. And as Charlene introduced me, I live and work within the homeland of the Lake Superior Ojibwe people in northern Wisconsin. I've been asked to share a case study of uh, Indigenous knowledge engagement, and uh, the project name is uh, Minasan, which is an Ojibwe word for the uh, word meaning islands. So I'm going to talk about oh, connecting Ojibwe ecological knowledge to climate change vulnerability in action. Before I do so, I would like to say Chi Miigwech, a big thank you to the many partners and individuals that helped with this project. You can see many of them listed here. And individuals on the right side, including tribal um, IK specialists, uh, uh, tribal historic preservation officers, tribal members, and the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. So Miigwech. To set the stage a little bit, um, when you bojo minutes, the Apostle Islands, which this project is about, lie within Gichigami, Anishinaabe, and the Dwad, the Great Sea, the Big Sea of the Anishinaabe people, or what we call Lake Superior in English. The Ojibwe people have lived here for centuries, and they have an active relationship with this land. The plant and animal beings are, are and with the plant and animal beings that are, are living here, they're considered relatives, not resources. And this relationship is based on respect and equitable coexistence. And it's important to set this stage because it has bearing on um, the best practices that we hope were incorporated in this project. The Treaty of 1854 removed the Ojibwe people from these islands and established permanent reservations at, at Misbibwakan, uh, Red Cliff, and Mashkabishi Bad River Medicine River along Lake Superior's Wisconsin shore. The tribes did reserve hunting, fishing, and gathering rights in these areas that were ceded to the U.S. government, but they maintained an active relationship uh, with the land and its being through all these centuries. In 1970, 21 of these islands were designated the Apostle Islands National Lake Shore uh, for administration by the National Park Service. Settler camps, cabins, etc., were removed from the islands, and they were restored to what we would call it their wilderness state. So with that stage set, um, here's the case study that I'd like to share with you for your consideration. The National Park Service, uh, NPS, Apostle Islands National Lakeshore, was concerned that continued climate change will challenge their mission to preserve and enhance the ecological and cultural legacy of what they call this remarkable place. And their response to this was to conduct an assessment of climate vulnerabilities and adaptation strategies for 11 Apostle Islands terrestrial ecosystems, island ecosystems. And this assessment was based on Western, what we call Western science, not a best word in the world, or academic science. Sometimes we call it scientific ecological knowledge. 
this type of research, SEK. And it was published by the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, a very reputable organization within the US Forest Service back in May of 2020. Ojibwe people were involved in this assessment, but not to the degree that um, that that could have been or perhaps should have been. And the, the National Park Service recognized this issue, the lack of indigenous ecological knowledge in the assessment. Their response was interesting though. Um, they decided to contract for an educational project to outreach this climate vulnerability assessment results that integrated Ojibwe ecological knowledge and promote stewardship for the general public, students and teachers. So how I was involved in the project, it was taken up through a contract through the University of Wisconsin Extension, who I work for, with uh, my role as PI on the project. So I started with my typical Western academic approach. I reviewed all of the assessment. You can see my notes there and my, my post-it notes on the side, looking for opportunities for educational messaging. I reviewed all the National Park Service climate change interpretation guidelines. And I looked at a review of how indigenous knowledge had been included in Park Service interpretation in the past. And what I really came to the conclusion was that Neither the assessment nor most Park Service interpretation integrates Indigenous knowledge as an equally valid way of knowing about climate change and responding to it. So the question is, what to do next? So I reached out to tribal partners and friends for their help and advice. Um, this project was accepted by the Tribal Climate Adaptation Menu, the TAM. Many of you are familiar with this document and this um, and and the guidelines within it. If you're not, I would highly recommend that you take a look at it. It's an excellent resource on climate adaptation, but also guidelines for integrating Indigenous knowledge and values into climate um, education and adaptation. So this was this project was accepted to receive that guidance, which I was so grateful for. And it was the first project, the first educational project to go through this TAM project. You can see on the left an example of the College of Menominee Nation. Many of you know Sarah Smith. She's featured there with a the group working on a TAM project. So as a result of the TAM training that I received, the path forward, and I'm going to suggest what we might call best practices, became clear. It started with seeking spiritual guidance through reflective time with our relatives, in this case, Lake Superior. We don't often think about this in our kind of Western mindset of how to go about doing uh, projects that integrate Indigenous knowledge, but this was what was recommended and turned out to be, um, I'm just very grateful for this start because it really grounded our project in a good way. And in fact, the, what I received from the lake after seeking guidance, you can see the little stone there on the right, a little basalt stone with a tiny stone inside of it that looks very much like Lake Superior. This was what I received from the lake after seeking this guidance and it by, became literally a touchstone for the project. Other best practices that moved the project forward was seeking guidance in a good way from those IK specialists and tribal partners on all project design and content. This takes time and space to build these relationships. Um, it can't be done quickly um, because this knowledge is so, so precious and dear. It takes trust to be built and it takes that time. Another guidance that we've built into the project as a best practice was infusing Ojibwe Mo in the Ojibwe language, which I'm learning and try to introduce myself in to begin our presentation in a good way. So Ojibwe Mo is infused within this project because it is the language of this land, right? That we're, that we're speaking about in this educational project. We also decided to flip the traditional way of integrating indigenous knowledge. Usually we, we have our academic Western science first, right? And then we integrate indigenous knowledge as an alternative way or a cross-cultural way of looking at things. This, this project does it exactly the other way, integrate using indigenous knowledge first and integrating SEK or scientific ecological knowledge as a cross-cultural way of understanding. We used IK from indigenous sources, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission's climate vulnerability assessment, um, the tribal adaptation menu, and also knowledge keepers themselves who I talked with and spent a lot of time with who generously contributed to this project. And 
there was reciprocity to all of these specialists and tribal partners for their contributions first before anything was shared with others. It went through all of them to make sure that it met, um, met their expectations, met their values, that we were representing this project in a good way with them. So here are some values that frame the Minasan content and design. Applying Ojibwe ecological knowledge, um, and you, integrating SEK for cross-cultural perspectives, as I mentioned before. Emphasizing the values, the Ojibwe values of respect, relationships, and responsibility and reciprocity. That as beings, as relatives, not resources, plants and animals. Interpreting climate change based on the interconnectedness of the Ojibwe four orders of creation within each ecosystem, the physical world, the plant world, and the human world. And then incorporating the Ojibwe seven teachings that you can see there respect, truth, courage, humility, honesty, wisdom, and love, both in project development, how we went about doing the project, and also the outreach of the project itself. Here's an example. So the project, um, originally it was going to be teacher training, and because of COVID, it became a website, which frankly was a better use for the project itself because we are able to really integrate these values into this website. Its name is Minasan. You'll have to you'll, you'll need to check it out yourself because we won't have time to go through it in my presentation. But let me point out a few of the features of the website that harken back to the 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 values that we have incorporated in it. The website design and function was developed in consultation with Indigenous knowledge specialists with final design determined by consensus. This is the view of the front page of the website. It has a hotspot map that opens to 12 ecosystems. You might remember I mentioned that the original Park Service Vulnerability Assessment had 11. Well, there's 12 in the Minnesota website because we included Lake Superior, because water connects all of them and connects all of us. So we have 12 ecosystems. The design elements reinforce connectedness. You can see the beadwork design that kind of travels off the edge of the website and the grandfather stones that surround the hotspot map to reinforce connectedness. Here's an example of one of the ecosystem sections, and I picked the Lake Superior ecosystem section, but there are 11 others, of course. Um, Ojibwe Moan is, is infused within the website. You can listen to the locations, both in written and audio form. There are beautiful 360 panoramas where you can explore each ecosystem virtually. And one thing that came out of this project that I didn't realize that many of our tribal youth aren't able and tribal members aren't even able to get out to the Apostle Islands themselves because you need a boat or you need to use the, the cruise service, which is very expensive. So people can actually see these ecosystems on this website and explore them using this panorama. The website at the bottom also features the four orders of the of Ojibwe creation, um, which connects its content. And there's an extra a section called Consider This that I'll cover in just a moment. Again, you can see they're connected by that beadwork, that beadwork border that connects and runs off the website, in, indicating and reinforcing the connectedness of all. This is an example of the human order. Remember, there's the four orders and the consider this section. Um, just to point out a couple features here, interactive videos that we can see in, on each of, the, each of the sections. The human order has the take action ideas, and these are based on um, climate, the tribal adaptation menu strategies and cultural values, indigenous climate adaptation strategies, and those are incorporated into this section. Educational messaging is done in an interpretive storytelling uh, style with um, Ojibwe Moan infused throughout it. And I mentioned that that uh, consider this section, which you can see at the very bottom of the of the screen here. Consider this. This is a this is a section of the website where we look at areas where we might challenge conve conventional Western thinking, and this is a great example of it. The SEK from the Apostle Islands Vulnerability Assessment in one of the ecosystems called the Erodible Marine Bluffs ecosystem classified it as having low vulnerability to climate change because these red clay bluffs typically slough off into Lake Superior. So species, species there are adapted to change. In talking with indigenous knowledge specialists, they said, Gawain, no, that's not true. These are highly vulnerable ecosystems. These are the places where our relatives camped, where there's burial sites, where we still hunt and gather. Um, these are important to us and these are highly vulnerable. So how we covered this on the website is in the consider this, 
questioning whose science do we use to evaluate climate change and adaptation strategies. To take a look at a comparison then of the frameworks between the two different projects, um, if we look at the vulnerability assessment done by the Park Service, we see its climate impacts on species. If we take a look at the Minnesan project that sprang from that assessment, we see that its climate impacts on all beings as relative through the interconnectedness of the Ojibwe Four Orders. We see on the assessment side, it's based on scientific, scientific ecological knowledge only. We see on the Minnesan side, we've based it on indigenous knowledge with SEK integrated to provide the cross-cultural perspective. Again, flipping that way of looking at it. We see on the assessment side, it acknowledges historic Ojibwe cultural uses. The Minnesan website though, integrates historic as well as contemporary uses, cultural uses by the Ojibwe, including treaty rights uses, which are extremely important. We see Ojibwe Moan incorporated in the assessment site in a glossary of plant names. But in the Minnesan website, we see Ojibwe Moan infused throughout the website. We see on the assessment side, it's visitor related climate adaptation actions. And we see on the Minnesan site, we've taken climate action strat strategies for all cultures based on Ojibwe values of respect, responsibility, relationships, and reciprocity. And finally, as you can see, this is a document style resource that we have in the climate vulnerability assessment done by the Park Service. And on the website, we have an interactive, updatable resource with interactive resources. So with that, I would say chi mi gwich. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share. And I will stop my sharing. My contact information is there. Hey, aloha mai kaku. I hope that you can see my screen OK. Just want to double check. Yes. OK, great. Mai kapi ina kala i hae hae a hiki ka ho iho ana kala i ka mole mai ole hua a i ho lani ku ki aloha nui a ka ko pa ka hia pau. O vau no o ka noai ula lani mori shige a he kanaka o iwi vau no kapahulu o ahu. From the rising of the sun at the eastern point of the Hawaiian archipelago at hae hae on Hawaii Island to its return beneath the surface at the root of Lehua Islet in the west and onto ho lani ku the western extent of our Hawaiian archipelago. Aloha to all of you and mahalo for listening in today. My name is Kanoi Morishige and I'm a Kanaka Oivi, Native Hawaiian from Kapohulu on the island of Oahu here in Hawaii. I serve as the Native Hawaiian Program Specialist for Noa Papahana Mokuakea Marine National Monument. And within the focus of this webinar, I'm very humbled and thankful to be here and to share space with you all today. And I look forward to shining light on the vital role of Kanaka Oivi leadership or Native Hawaiian leadership, advocacy, succession planning, and relationship building um, that really set a standard of cultural integrity, trust, and mutual respect guiding the co-management, the diverse and collective co-management journey of Papahana Mokuakea to protect this sacred space. So first off, let's orient ourselves to where Papahana Mokuakea is located. It's in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, and that's of course, Northwest of the inhabited Hawaiian Islands, as you can see here on this map. And it spans about 1,200 miles or approximately 2,000 kilometers. As one of the world's largest marine protected areas and a UNESCO mixed natural and cultural world heritage site, from its creation to its management and to its expansion, the co-management of Papahanaumokuakea has been shaped by more than 20 years of trust and relationships built between co-managing agencies and the Native Hawaiian community. These efforts are part of a vision set forth um, to protect this place as an aina akua, or the realm of our gods, um, and an aina kopuna, our ancestral islands, um, to which we see this, this space um, as kanaka oivi. These efforts are part of a generational legacy, growing a collective pilina, or relationship to Papahana Mokuakea, and really inspires um, an inclusive and shared sense of kuleana, or rights um, and privileges, rights, responsibilities, and privileges um, to care for this ancestral place and to let it inspire the way we care for our places, the places that sustain us. Um, Kanaka Oivi look forward, um, look towards this Olelo no Eau or Hawaiian proverb as a profound example of the way we move in this world. Ikovama mua kavama hope. 
the future, um, the future is in the past. One always looks to the past to guide the future. Um, this is a beautiful um, creation that was that was um, created by gifted Kanaka Oivi artist Solomon Enos, um, depicting Papahānaumokuākea. So the name Papahānaumokuākea um, was given by Dr. Pualani Kanaka Ole Kanahele, an esteemed kupuna or elder, leader, and cultural expert within our Oivi, our Native Hawaiian communities here in Hawaii. And the name honors the union of Papa Hanamoku, a motherly figure personified by earth and all living things, and Wakea, the expanse or space or sky, and their union embodies the creation or birthing of our Hawaii Pai Aina, our Hawaiian archipelago. Papahanamoku Akea includes many atolls, um, reefs, submerged seamounts, and other geological features. And these are some pictures um, of what these islands look like. And they all have Hawaiian, traditional Hawaiian names that we continue to uplift and use throughout coal management today. And they're um, affectionately referred to as our Kupuna Islands or our ancestral islands. Papahanaumoku Akea provides crucial land and marine habitats for 23 threatened and endangered plant and animal species. It's also a vi vital feeding, um, nesting and nursery habitat for many species, including seabirds and honu or um, sea turtles. Um, and so all of these living creatures through a Kanaka Oivi native Hawaiian worldview, these are our ancestors. And as Kanaka Oivi, we have a rich repository of oral narratives such as creation chants, songs, stories, and histories um, where data of our environment and our relationship to it are embedded within. And they speak to the creation of our islands. Um, and within Papahanaumokuakea, in many cases, um, these oral narratives documented the journey to and back from um, Papahanaumokuakea, where our Akua, or gods, and Ali'i, our chiefs, um, would go to to demonstrate their expertise and mana, or spiritual power. This ancestral legacy is perpetuated by the Polynesian Voyaging Society today, um, who train the next generation of navigators who continue to access Papahanaumokuakea, um, and also by Native Hawaiian experts through the research conducted by the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation, conducting research on the cultural uprights and structures um, that remain in Papahanaumokuakea, and that we know today through their research, um, some of which are used to track the movement of the sun and other celestial bodies. Papahanaumokuakea represents the intersection of two realms in Hawaiian worldview, and that's pole, or the primordial darkness, um, a place of Akua, our gods, and ancestral, spirit, ancestral spirits, and Ao, the realm of light, consciousness, and the realm of all living things. And this is a renowned Hawaiian creation chant that's more than 2,000 lines long. Um, and I just everyone, want everyone to keep in mind that um, Kanaka Oibi descend, like many other indigenous groups, descend from um, oral narratives uh, and knowledge was passed down. Um, through oral forms, so more than 2,000 lines long. And it really, it um, I don't have um, time to go into the depth of it, but it does set the foundation, coral as a foundational life form um, and establishes the kinship of all life. And Kanaka Oivi have a familial relationship to all living things of the lands, oceans of Hawaii Pai Aina. And there's, so there's a strong codependence where um, all the living things were born, starting with the coral and um, Kanaka or people were born last. Uh, and this map shows those two realms across the Hawaiian archipelago. Um, and Mokumanamana, the island of Mokumanamana sits on that transition or that boundary, the northern limit of the sun's journey on the horizon. So that line represents the Tropic of Cancer. And through OEV worldview, we know this as Kiala. Kiala Nui Polohiva a Kane, the dark glistening path of Kane. So Papahanaumokuakea is managed by NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, NOAA Fisheries, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the State of Hawaii, Department of Land and Natural Resources, and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Since 2008, for about 15 years now, the co-managers of this Marine National Monument have emphasized indigenous traditional ecological knowledge in all aspects of management. And they've shown this commitment over time through concrete action, through creating opportunities to involve cultural practitioners, 
um, in, in an ethical way. Um, and that's, this really led to the guidance, um, to critical guidance on developing a rigorous permitting process with culturally appropriate standards and procedures and creating opportunities for equitable and ethical partnerships inclusive of Native Hawaiians. Um, these are a few examples of the integrated policies, plans, and protections um, that are woven throughout um, co-management. I would just like to point out here that the monument permitting process includes all co-managers, and that's also inclusive of Office of Hawaiian Affairs, who facilitates the Papahanaumokuakea Native Hawaiian Cultural Working Group um, to review all, all permits, not just Native Hawaiian permits, but all of them, as this collective effort moving forward to work together with co-managers, reinforcing strict policies and protections to protect Papahanaumokuakea as a biocultural seascape. Um, these are some examples of the guiding principles integrated into the policies and plans. Within the governance um, and management structure, historically, there have been one to three dedicated positions within NOAA and one to two dedicated positions within the Office of Hawaiian Affairs for Native Hawaiian programmatic goals. My position at NOAA builds on the work done by several Hawaiians before me who have carved important space within NOAA, within um, Papahanaumokuakea, and ha have really advocated um, for systemic change within this federal agency. I recognize and acknowledge the years that our kupuna, our elders, and Native Hawaiian communities have fought to protect Papahanaumokuakea, including securing this position I currently hold. Kanaka are represent in Noa, Kanaka are represented in federal and contract positions, so it's really a blended workforce. Uh, but nevertheless, I can't stress how imperative it is to have these indigenous positions in federal agencies. It's, it's a concrete commitment from agencies um, to really honor the importance of indigen indigenous knowledge and expertise. And it allows us to um, self represent, it increases our opportunities for self representation of our, in this case, Native Hawaiian culture. So nothing about us without us. And being able to have Kanaka OEV Native Hawaiian co workers um, within, not just within Papahanaumokuakea, but within NOAA allows us to um, engage in supporting multidisciplinary cross collaborations, addressing critical topics within research, policy management and communication and outreach strategies. Um, and this, because it's based on um, Kanaka OEV um, giving special attention to important considerations um, from the lessons learned um, and the personal pilina or relationships and lived experiences that we've grown um, through engaging with our Hawaiian communities over time. This helps, this overall helps in, um, build an inclusive process um, to work with Indigenous and non-Indigenous staff members um, to navigate the political, cultural, and social environment in discussions and to support the protection of this place. Cultural Working Group and Kanako Oivi, or Native Hawaiians working within Noa Papahanaumokuakea, have woven cultural protocol guidance um, into all aspects of management. And this is just a, a small spotlight on um, a document created by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and Noho Papa um, as a cultural protocol guidance document um, in consultation with the Cultural Working Group. And it provides foundational knowledge of Hawaiian cultural protocol. And it really is a powerful way to encourage, ask, encourage all people who enter Papahanaumokuakea, whatever activities they're doing, it encourages them to ask for permission to enter these ancestral spaces with deep respect, being clear about intentions and conducting, your, conducting themselves in an appropriate manner. Um, so a little background on the Culture Working Group, which I'll refer to now as the CWG. Um, since 2001, the CWG has represented the Native Hawaiian community voice, um, providing advice to the Monument Management Board um, through the co-manager and co-trustee, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Um, it must be said that um, the executive order that created the original reserve also created the Reserve Advisory Council, known as the RAC. And the RAC set aside 20% of the seats for Native Hawaiians. And within the work of the RAC, they created these working groups, one of them being the Native Hawaiian Working Group. So it was originally supported by NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, operated under the rules um, and operating procedures of the RAC. Um, be, but because 
working groups usually sunset um, their their temporary the co-managers um, and the RAC uh, recognize that they don't want to lose the ability to convene the CWG as they provide really critical um, um, guidance for the co-management of Papahanaumokuakea. So OHA, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, stepped up to um, take over and to facilitate and support the CWG in continuing, continuing to advise on all management activities, not just the Native Hawaiian ones. Cultural Working Group was a significant force in creating the strong political protections of Papahanaumokuakea today. And this is a picture of Uncle Buzzy Agard, um, very active with um, political advocacy to protect Papahanaumokuakea um, at the federal level. Um, and the Cultural Working Group, the CWG, is comprised of um, this strong leadership and representation from our community leaders across the Pai Aina, across our archipelago. The CWG consists of farmers, fishermen, fish pond keepers, rock wall builders, and keepers of hula and protocol. They are the keepers of tradition, educators, researchers on our shorelines and watersheds, sailors and voyagers, policymakers, community gatherers, and advocates, and the list goes on. They have deep connections and historical ties to Papahanaumokuakea through a living pilina or relationship bound by genealogy, cultural protocols, and values building contemporary multidisciplinary research and practice. The CWG is internationally known for culturally, cultural integrity and forged relationships that have influenced and maintained the importance of meaningful and respectful engagement and behavior. Without the vision and trust of our initiators, like Lili Kala Kamealehiva, Carlos Andrade Halealoha Hale Ayao, Auntie Laura Thompson, Uncle Buzzy Agard, Auntie Pua Kanahele, Kekueva Kikiloi, and many other Kanaka Oivi outside and within the agency, World Heritage would not have been a success. The resources, respect, operation, and management of Papahanaumokuakea would not be what it is today without the CWG and the relationships that they tended to and the advocacy they did and the way that they connected it back into our, our Hawaiian communities and local communities here in Hawaii. Oh, and it must be said that I was um, I had I was involved with the culture working group before um, I took this position. So it's all part of this this legacy set forth um, by our OEV leaders. The CWG has been instrumental in groundbreaking initiatives like our nomenclature uh, or naming Hui to reclaim spaces, um, defining and articulating a collective present day relationship through the creation of Hawaiian names as a placeholder for future generations. This process produced more than 60 Hawaiian names for birds, algae, and deep sea coral species rooted in a transparent and ethical process in collaboration with scientists. CWG has a Kiamanu subcommittee who recommends how the Migratory Bird Tree Act permit is utilized within Papahanaumokuakea, and they play a really important role in advising managing agencies on seabird collections, gathering processes, and culturally grounded protocols. Um, to perpetuate, to collect um, bird feathers and perpetuate traditional Hawaiian cultural practices. In addition to the work that Culture Working Group has produced, um, Noa Papahanaumokuakea uh, has been supporting Native Hawaiian partnerships from creation to implementation. So programs like the Ku'ula Traditional Marine Management Course um, that was born out of a partnership um, an intentional partnership between UH Chilo and Noa Papahanaumokuakea. Um, this course has contributed leaps and bounds in how institutional research is conducted and applied in management. Ku'ula made a huge impact to our community, our practices and culture, providing concrete mentorship, professional development opportunities, and encouraged the growth of diverse skill sets towards career pathways in Papahanaumokuakea um, and beyond to care for Hawaii's resources and communities. These students have gone on to agencies like NOAA, DLNR, Fish and Wildlife, Outside of that, um, in the University of Hawaii, conservation NGOs like Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy, and they also hold really important positions um, education, within education and, and community engagement. I'm a living testament to the impact of succession building, um, being a former student of the first Ku'ula cohort. From that opportunity, my eyes were opened up to Papahana Mokuakea. Um, and all the, the mentorship and those opportunities, those support networks have really led me down a path to which now I get to serve as um, Native Hawaiian Program Specialist um, to hopefully continue this legacy in, in some way. 
Another partnership that NOAA has supported is with Namaka Onauna, whose beginnings sprouted from the Kula course at UH Hilo and the Papahano Mokuakea Intertidal Partnership. For more than 15 years, they've conducted intertidal research to support the sustainable management of opihi, or our Hawaiian limpet species, through a deeper understanding of seasonal cycles and productivity. They've developed a tool to support communities in indigenous literacy and tracking seasonal cycles and indicators used across um, the archipelago in Papahana Mokuakea with our monk seal, turtle, um, and field crews out at um, Holaniku or Kure Atoll. Uh, NOAA has also supported longstanding partnerships with the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation, a cultural based nonprofit perpetuating the teachings, beliefs, practices, philosophies, and traditions while elevating Hawaiian intelligence through cultural education. Another long-standing partner has been Juliao Pa'a, a nonprofit providing training, community engagement, and advocacy, um, with also a business um, um, organization that focuses on research and compliance projects. In 2021, the Native Hawaiian guidance document, Maika Po Mai, was published um, that now formally supports Papaha Namokuakea using Hawaiian worldview, knowledge, values, concepts, and cultural traditions to set the foundation and framework for the co-management of Papaha Namokuakea as a biocultural seascape. And it aligns with Native Hawaiian and federal management responsibilities and mandates and provides guidance to weave culture into all aspects of management. Um, so I'd just like to close uplifting this theme, Ikovama, Muakovama, Hope. Um, this is all part of a legacy of work um, that has been led by the Cultural Working Group, and many hands have contributed to um, within co-managing agencies, within NOAA, Indigenous, non-Indigenous. This has been a very diverse and collective journey to protect this place um, in a way that's um, congruent with Kanaka OEV worldview, values, knowledge systems, and, and practices. So I know I'm running out of time, but part of this, um, this movement is hopefully we can head towards a direction where we're building inclusive approaches, recognizing the success of diverse experience-based perspectives and knowledge systems, um, inclusive of multiple knowledge systems, weaving these knowledge systems to really get to, uh, um, to really develop strategies together and get to a future where we can protect this biocultural seascapes in equitable, ethical, um, and in Pono, we call it in Hawaii, in um, appropriate ways. So with that, I'm sorry I went a little bit over, but I'd like to end with an excerpt from a mele or a mele oli, a chant that was created by Kainani Kahonaele and Haleoloha Ayao. Um, and it speaks to our path moving forward, protecting this place um, and cultivating a, a living relationship um, with this space, um, just like our Kanako Iwi culture is living and breathing, um, so too are these, these places, and we hope that they can continue on um, to thrive into the future. So, Hano Hano Vale Kaina Kupuna Onamokule Ia, honored is the land of our ancestors, the islands of abundance. No Papa Hano Mokua Kea La Heinoa. So, this is a group effort, and I just wanted to end by saying that. Papahana Mokuakea and the co-management structure and cohesiveness of the way we work together exists today. Um, it's not perfect, but it exists today. Um, the guidance is there because of the trust nurtured and insisted on by the network and individuals of the Native Hawaiian Culture Working Group. So with that, mahalo nui to all of you, and I look forward to hearing any questions you may have um, towards the end. Mahalo. All right, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. So hello, everyone. I want to start off by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. It's really an honor to be here with the rest of today's speakers, as well as the really great speakers that we've heard so far in this webinar series. Um, so I'm going to focus my case study on a project that took place a few years ago and was a collaboration between the USGS, the US Geological Survey, the Chivac Traditional Council, and the Kalik Tribal Council. And this project was called the yukon Kuskokwim Delta Berry Outlook or um, another title is Climate and Disturbance Driven Changes in Subsistence Berries in Coastal Alaska, um, Indigenous Knowledge to Inform Ecological Inference. So as the title suggests, this project took place in the Yukon, Kuskokwim Delta in Western Alaska in collaborations with the communities of Chivak, Hooper Bay, Amonic, and Kotlik, with particularly close collaboration between the USGS and the Chivak Traditional Council and Kotlik Tribal Council. 
So this collaboration is really based on what at the time was about a decade of collaborative community-based environmental monitoring across the Yukon River Basin, both in um, Canada and Alaska, as part of a project we call the Indigenous Observation Network that is facilitated by our close partners at the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council. So berry producing plants are a really key subsistence resource in indigenous communities across Alaska, and berries are also concern, consumed by birds. And in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, this is an area in terms of both density and species diversity that's the most important shorebird nesting area in the country. And it's also home to the Yukon Kuskokwim Wildlife uh, Refuge. Birds are also an important subsistence species in these species in this communities, and thus both the human and the wildlife communities may be affected by decreased berry abundance. So this project really sought to address a gap in the tools and the data that is necessary to predict how the distribution and the productivity of berry producing plants might be changed um, by climate induced landscape change. So we really just sought to understand if berry resources were changing in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, what might be driving these changes and what the future might be like by weaving together indigenous knowledge with other scientific approaches. So given our existing partnership with the tribal councils in these communities as part of their participation in the indigenous observation network in terms of both collecting water quality samples in the rivers in their communities, as well as hosting an active layer permafrost monitoring site, we had established a pretty long-term relationship with the tribal councils, as well as many community members in this region. So we approached the tribal councils to gauge their interest in working with us on this project and ultimately to gain permission to conduct this study in their communities. I'm going to discuss the methods in um, a little bit more detail in a few minutes, but we ended up working with the Kotlik and the Chivac uh, tribal councils to identify the appropriate berry species that would be of interest to them for our study, as well as to develop um, some of the survey questions that we would use. When we were in the communities conduct conducting the work, our collaborators from the tribal councils worked with us to identify the knowledge holders that we should work with to complete our survey. And before participating in the study, all of the participants were informed of and consented to how the knowledge that they shared with us would be applied to answer our research questions and would ultimately be shared publicly. So to learn indigenous knowledge of berry ecology and answer our research questions about how and why berry resources might be changing, we used a specific type of survey called a cultural consensus survey, as well as participatory mapping to understand where berries were located and differences in location between different types of berries and how those locations might be changing over time. So cultural, as I mentioned, this is a specific type of survey, these cultural consensus surveys, and they have some, um, some baked in assumptions with them. So one, it assumes that uh, all of the survey respondents share a common culture, that the answers that are provided by each respondent are independent of all other respondents, so each person answers independently, and then all of the questions are on one topic and are on the same level of difficulty. So the survey questions in a cultural consensus survey are all statements that then the respondents either agree or disagree with or say that they don't know. So a couple of example statements that we used in our survey are, if there's a small amount of snow in the winter, there will be fewer berries in the summer. Or my family travels a farther distance than in the past to gather this berry. And the response options then were yes, no, or I don't know. So for the participatory mapping piece, after a respondent had completed the survey, we asked them to then draw locations where they harvest each berry species that they had indicated that they harvest on the survey. And if those locations had changed over time to indicate both the past harvesting locations and where they're harvesting those berries currently. And this was done using USGS topographic maps overlaid with mylar sheeting that then participants just drew directly onto. So this is similar to um, the process that I believe was used in the, the polar bear example that uh, Sarah gave in her presentation earlier. We then took these mylar sheets and uh, manually digitized them in ArcMap to create uh, digital maps. So this slide just shows the number of participants from each of the villages that we worked with, as well as some demographic information. So we had a pretty even number of respondents from um, Hooper Bay, Chivac, and Amonic from those communities, but then we had almost double the number of respondents from the village of Kotlik. As part of the survey, we asked folks to give us a little bit of demographic information, like their age, the number of years they had lived in their community, and then the number of years they've been picking berries. 
So on average, the participants had spent about 46 years in their home communities, 43 of those years picking berries, and their ages ranged, in, ranged from 30 to 79. So this is an example of survey responses that are combined for all of the communities for just one berry species, for salmon berries. So the first question on, on the survey asked the respondent if that particular berry was important in their household. And for salmon berries, 100% of the respondents answered yes to this question. 75% of respondents agreed that they're traveling farther than in the past to harvest salmon berries. 86% agreed that um, a small amount of snow is associated with fewer salmon berries the following spring. And 88% agreed that hot summer temperatures can impact how many salmon berries there will be. And then 82% um, agreed that this, with the statement that salmon berries are ripening earlier in the season than they did 10 years ago. So this is an example of aggregated salmon berry harvesting locations. So putting all of the, the drawn maps together from all of the communities onto one map. And the, the orange colors here indicate some of the current harvesting locations, while yellow color indicates the past harvesting locations. So this can show us how these locations might be changing over time. And then there's um, some of the darker locations are where more folks indicated that they were harvesting. So there's some overlap there. And what's really interesting when we look just at this map is that we can see there's a lot of um, change happening around the village of Chivak, where there's um, a lot more past harvesting locations. So we can use maps like this combined with ecological data to tell us whether the change that we're seeing in harvesting locations is due to changes in habitat suitability, or if there may be other things going on, um, other related social trends and drivers that are causing folks to change their harvesting locations. So these are the results of the responses to statements that were related to potential drivers of berry changes in abundance and distribution for three berries, salmon berry, crowberry or blackberry, and blueberry. And it shows the, uh, the percent of respondents who agreed with each statement by community. And we can see that the drivers, the two drivers with the most agreement across all communities and all berries were that hot summer temperatures and low winter snowpack were both having negative effects on berry resources. So we took this, this, um, these community identified drivers and combined them with climate models projections for the region. So project, projected mean winter and summer temperatures and winter snowfall um, are shifting substantially in the study region by the mid and late 21st century as compared with average historical values. So winter temperatures are projected to increase at about double the rate of summer temperature increases from a historical value, median value of negative 14 degrees Celsius to negative seven degrees Celsius by mid-century and negative two degrees Celsius by late century. Summer temperatures are projected to increase from 11 degrees Celsius to 14 degrees Celsius in mid-century and then 16 degrees Celsius by late century. Projected winter snowfall at mid-century is about two thirds um, of the historical amount. And by mid-century snowfall amount is half of the historical average. So you can see here the way that these, these drivers that are identified um, by the indigenous residents in these communities um, are gonna be changing over time and potentially impacting berry resources. As the resolution of climate models increases and we're able to zoom in a little bit closer to community, um, to community regions, as opposed to these broader regional um, views, we can get a better idea of how berry abundance and distribution um, might be impacted in the specific harvesting locations that communities shared with us. So I also wanted to highlight the ways in which we communicated the results. Um, I really um, appreciated Kat's presentation and how um, those results were shared with the communities before they were shared with anyone else. Um, we conducted this research in, um, in these communities in the month of February. And then in October, we returned to the communities and gave presentations to explain the results from the community as compared to all of the other communities overall. We also put together a plain language community data report without any interpretation of the results that we shared when we gave those presentations. And this was shared with the, the tribal councils and the communities, as well as the communities that participated in the, in the surveys and the mapping. Um, next, we developed a USGS data release with all of the information aggregated, so summarized, um, so no individual responses are viewable, just summarized at the community level. And this is um, open for any, uh, anyone in the public to get access to. We also put together a journal article that was co-authored with one of our community partners who helped 
tremendously and assisted with the data collection, um, Cynthia Paniak, who's the environmental coordinator for the CHIVAC Traditional Council. So our next steps here are, in order to extend our understanding of ecological change in this region, based on the indigenous knowledge that was shared with us, we have installed weather stations in two communities in the villages of Chivac and Kotlik. And these are co-located with our existing permafrost monitoring sites. We also developed a community-based berry monitoring protocol and a snow depth monitoring protocol. So we could start tracking the snow that was identified as an important driver. Um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we haven't been able to visit these sites. Um, we were supposed to fly out there in February of 2020, right before the pandemic hit, um, and were unable to get into the communities because of a blizzard um, that prevented us from visiting them. So we have plans to get these um, sites up and running again as soon as possible to begin really long-term ecological monitoring with our community partners with the goal of informing some mitigation strategies that might be able to, uh, to increase the abundance of berries in these regions and adaptation strategies, you know, specifically around berry resources. And so with that, I want to acknowledge our other community partners that were really huge and key in getting this work completed. Um, Bernard Murren, Earl Atichak, Victor Tunachuk Jr., um, Kelly Elder, and everybody in these communities that shared their, um, their knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our presenters for sharing all of this great knowledge with us and these presentations. We, we really appreciate you coming in and being a part of this today. Um, and we, we do have time for some questions uh, for our presenters. Sarah, you, you started off by uh, discussing a couple of examples and the question came up, were there any protocols to discuss data sovereignty with tribal members with those projects? So we, I did not have, Fish and Wildlife Service does not have a protocol. Um, we were, the, the tribes, several of the tribes asked the Fish and Wildlife Service to talk to them about their traditional knowledge. They know a lot about the wolf, so we were, asked to incorporate this and nobody had ever done that before. And so I think when I did show up face to face, um, they were very pleased with that. And I can think I can, I can answer the third question too, that they're not gonna, they did not, and this was in my research with the uh, Western Apache, the stories they told me what, what the, um, Tyson Running Wolf uh, from the Blackfeet said was, I gave you the redacted version. No, he didn't say redacted. He said the G version. I can't tell you all of the culturally information. I just gave you just enough information. You're not a tribal member and you're not a member of my family. This is a very important story. So they did not tell me things that they did not want me to hear. So uh, I, I think I answered both the first and the third question, at least I hope I did. Thank you so much. Kat, a question came up that you also indicated you'd like to answer live that said, my family comes from Bad River. Does this Minnesota website have opportunities, links for tribal youth to get involved in the field of climate science? Yes, it does. And I want to say I, I typed and I didn't realize there was an option for live or type. So I hit the live button, but that's great. Um, yes, it does. The human section of each of the ecosystem sections, the way that it's developed, um, has action items that are for youth to adults. Um, so th those are those are on the website, yes. So thanks for asking that question. I could have typed it easily. <laughs> I believe this question was for Kano, that uh, what mixture of interest and resistance have you encountered in augmented reality mobile resources that would take further steps to provide visitors with overlays of language and perspectives as they move through these places? Thinking about least, Leaf snap, Merlin, et cetera, and including traditional names, uses, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think for us, that's a really important topic. And we kind of take it on a case by case basis, um, especially because all the people that want to do activities in Papahanaumokuakea or related to Papahanaumokuakea have to um, submit an app permit application um, to which the co managers can review it all. Um, but I, we try, at least for the place names for the islands, we try to, oh, sorry, I think my screen froze. Can you still hear me? <laughs> we can still hear you. 
Okay, great. Let me just try and shut off the audio. I mean, the video. Yeah, so um, we try to uplift information about these traditional Hawaiian names for the islands um, and provide that and make it accessible in the right ways. Um, definitely citing the Kanaka scholars or Native Hawaiian scholars um, and the primary literature resources for those names um, that come from our chants and different um, archival resources. Uh, we did run into one controversial topic in the past um, with concerns from the culture working group in regards to putting images of Google Street um, accessibility images um, of certain of our ancestral islands on Google. So that was where um, CWG really was not comfortable and had serious concerns about um, sharing uh, our cultural images of our cultural sites um, that are located up there on such a global um, worldwide platform. So um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question case by case. Thank you. Uh, for Nicole, were there any barriers and community members trusting the process of this work, especially with the participatory mapping and surveys of past and current harvesting locations and practices, or were they very respective, very receptive? Uh, what attributes do you think were key in the smooth collaboration, if they were receptive, excuse me? Sorry, that, that question was directed at Nicole, if you are comfortable answering. Oh, I see. I'm sorry, I just joined back in. I don't know if I was frozen for you all, but I lost the internet. There's, could you repeat the question? I apologize. Absolutely. Yes, it said, were there any barriers in community members trusting the process of this work, especially with the participatory mapping and surveys of past and current harvesting locations and practices? Or if they were very receptive, what attributes do you think were key in the smooth collaboration? Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. Um, we did not meet um, any resistance in sharing the berry harvesting locations or participating in the survey. And I attribute that really to the long term relationship that we've had in these communities. Um, I've been working in this region since 2008, and we work with the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council. Um, that project has been going on since 2006. And so I think um, because of the trust that we've, that we've worked hard to earn and maintain in the communities over time, as well as um, the working closely with partners at the tribal councils to do the work. I think that that really um, helped us be trusted in how we would use the information that was shared with us. Thank you. And I think this one goes out to the panel. Can anyone share challenges or insights they experienced regarding language, terminology, jargon, etc.? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I'll just say that so for our study, um, looking at, at berries, there was a you know Latin species name for salmon berries that did not equate to a salmon berry, but that is what the communities called that berry type. And so there was some translation in the the kind of Western science world of saying like, oh no, this is the berry that these folks are harvesting, and this is the name they attributed to it, even though salmon berries might be called something somewhere else. Um, and so that was a really interesting um, thing of trying to take like a cultural understanding of a resource and translate that to a different scientific understanding of it. Um, I'm not seeing the question. Could you repeat the question real quick? Of course. Can anyone share challenges or insights they experienced regarding language, terminology, jargon, et cetera? Oh, yeah. I, when, during my research with uh, Western Apache and the Mexican wolf, there were things that just didn't translate. And a lot of people that I interviewed wanted to speak in their native language. And then I had my uh, person with me that was interpreting and so I know I missed a lot of information because of of yes language and not being in the culture uh, it's very difficult uh, especially from somebody outside uh, I did my best but yes that was uh, um that was a kind of a barrier
I'll move on to another question for the presenters. In retrospect, what, if anything, would you do differently to ensure the project benefited Native partners? I'll jump in on that one. Um, the, this project, it was interesting that the contract was given to the university and not to a tribal partner for the development of the Minnesota website. Um, so how it was ha how I handled it is I actually worked under, I contracted with an IK specialist that I shared some of our contract money with to help me in an effort to kind of be practice some reciprocity for this contract not going to a tribal partner. To me, that was an oversight by the National Park Service to do this this way. Um, but it's the way that it, the project happened. So um, as I mentioned in one of my emails back, I think it was to Jake, one of my um, comments, to including um, indigenous perspectives, tribal members, elders, um, IK specialists throughout the entire project first before anything was shared and making sure that that website was provided Ojibwe perspectives um, with SEK integrated in um, was the way that we handled that. I hope that answers the question. Uh, my response would just be more time. I was on the time crunch on a couple of projects and more time and um, um, having the Fish and Wildlife Service be more, um, having a better relationship with, with people where they could talk about this more and more follow-up. And I intend on doing that. I uh, mentioned that to our region um, in the Rocky Mountains that this isn't a one and done. I went and interviewed people, but this isn't a one and done. You need to keep, keep the dialogue. Yeah, I would say for us, I would have liked to have had more, um, I would have liked a better way to share the results than we did. I think we tried really hard to get the community to have their community presentations and the community reports, but I would have liked to have had there be more actions that were readily, able to be readily taken by the communities. And we also, the initial funding from this came from what don't exist anymore, but landscape conservation cooperatives. And that I think is fish and wildlife funding. So they were really interested in the project because of the wildlife refuge there and um, more work with them on how they could maybe implement some strategies in the landscape around the communities to increase berry resources would have been um, better. So more like actionable impact. But I think as Sarah mentioned, time, we're always time constrained. And so I think that's something we all have to push for in this work is to expand that time and be able to, to, to follow through a little bit more on some things. And then I just wanted to add, at least for Papahanaumokuakea, um, I tried to really emphasize that in the presentation, but sort of kind of thinking long term and, and sort of the investment back into creating these um, positions for indigenous um, people within agency um, encourage a, a sense of reciprocity and not just extractive you know extracting knowledge um, and this also blends into the way that we're trying to transform the way that research is conducted in Papahanaumokuakea and this has many parallels with the way that Hawaiian communities in Hawaii are trying to set the bar for what equitable and um, ethical research partnerships should look like when you're working with um, Indigenous and, and specifically Native Hawaiian communities. Um, so we always try to um, support those kind of strategies. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I just wanted to take a moment to, oh, also to introduce myself. I'm Elda Varela Mindero with the National Cask and uh, was part of the planning committee for this webinar series. Uh, but thank you to all of our presenters for being a part of this today. Thank you for all the participants for coming in and learning more about um, Indigenous knowledges and the webinar series. Um, as was mentioned earlier, this will be recorded and posted online and we will share that with uh, all those who registered. And we want to just take a moment to also note that the fifth and final webinar in the series will take place June 1st at 3 p.m. Eastern and that will be on best practices for engaging tribal nations and, indig and indigenous peoples surrounding indigenous knowledges. Thank you so much for everyone for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone, Miigwech. Mahalo.